The Venus Project TeamSpeak Seminar, July 22, 2012. I'm going to talk about human behavior or the behavioral sciences in the future. I would say that psychology today and psychiatry is limited because they work on the person. And people say, well, what's wrong with that? If you work on, a, if you get a dented automobile with all kinds of dented fenders and you study dents, that doesn't tell you what made the dents in the cars. And if you get a bunch of products like frying pans with a distorted handle and you study distorted handles only, you don't understand it's the factory that produces them that has something wrong with the machine. So you have to study the environment the object came from. Then you can see that the dents were in the dyes at the factory. But if you study the dents, when you study human behavior today, you're studying the person rather than the environment that shaped those behaviors. If you study the South, where the Ku Klux Klan had three million members, you can study the conditions that made people the value system except those of the Ku Klux Klan. You don't study the Klansman. He's a product of the environment. So all psychiatry works on a person. Why do you feel anxiety? What is it that makes you feel that way? Do you resent your grandfather or your grandmother? They go into a lot of abstractions. They should study the environment. If you study the environment, you can know everything about an Indian and how he behaves, or a headhunter of the Amazon, if you study the environment he comes from. If you fly over a city with thatched huts, un really thatched huts, not, not a tourist center, with imitation thatched huts, people that live in a small group in the forest, if they live in thatched huts, you can pretty much predict that they are hunters, and gatherers, you know, and find animals and shoot them with bow and arrows. You don't need to study the person. The environment will tell you a lot. If a person says, I was raised as a Catholic ever since I was four years old, well, that tells you a hell of a lot. Do you ask them, do you accept Catholic? Yes. Then that means that the environment they came from was a Catholic environment. My father was very rigid, and he always beat my mother, and he locked my sister in a closet when she didn't behave herself. So your sister has a fear or claustrophobia from that. Do you know what I mean? She doesn't, isn't born that way. Somehow she picks up experience. Or she says, if the father beats the mother too much, I'm never getting married. All your values are shaped by what you've experienced. They're not the truth. They're the truth for you. So let's say that again. If you get a watch with broken crystals, the crystal on the front of the watch is broken, and you study the watch and the way it was broken, you might say it was due to impact. Where did the person get that from? Environment. So a person's behavior, the major aspects, are shaped by environment. The non-major aspects, if a bird is born and it doesn't feed its young, let's say it's just born genetically different. It comes back with food and eats it itself. Then its species dies out. And the only species that are alive are those that feed their young. If a mother has internal secretion during the state of pregnancy, as the pregnancy evolves, the endocrine glands the, the endorphins come forth and it makes her feel good. And she's on cloud nine, but her appetite changes. She wants to eat many different things. All that's internal secretion. That's genetically altered behavior due to changes in internal secretion. Either you're more tolerant, easygoing, or less tolerant. The mother that doesn't feel good being pregnant and doesn't feel any of those patterns usually dies out. So all you got is the existing patterns that work. If a bird lands at the nest and has a lot of other birds 
is opening them out, it's squawking, and it pushes them out of their nest, it'll survive well, but it'll have no offspring, and the species dies out. So I'm just saying that everything seems very nice in nature, because we're not around watching what doesn't work. Remember the story about the soldier who saw rustling in the bushes? And the other soldier was about to shoot the, the rustling in the bushes. And the first soldier said, it may be one of our boys hurt, crawling back to the camp. So he goes up to the bushes and Jeff shoots the guy. So if you're born or you're brought up to be more inquisitive, to be more careful before you use your machine gun, you may not survive in a war situation. If you shoot first and then look, say, well, I didn't know who it was, you'd be excused. I thought it was one of them. Maybe I thought it was one of our boys, but I didn't, there were so many chaps sneaking around, I didn't want to take that chance. Well, sometimes good sense is what? Depends on the circumstances. I can't tell you what to do, what is right, what is wrong. In a war situation, you shoot anything that moves. I told you about the minor bird, and the Japanese used to yell out, Yankee, come out and fight. They used to yell from the trees out. Now the minor bird did the same thing. You say, Yankee, come out and fight with a Japanese accent. So they used to shoot up in the tree. And they wasted a lot of ammunition until some kind of biologist found out about the minor bird and told them to be careful. There are birds that do that. Don't waste your bullets. So it's very difficult because most psychology well, all the psychology I know of seems to study the person, all aspects of human behavior, except the environment. Or they say they may come from an environment that was intolerant. But if you show that everything comes from environment in relation to behavior. Now, I don't know if you know this, but there are hypnotists that hypnotize people. That is, the way they work is they say, relax, rest easily, and then they whisper to them. And they say, go ahead and there's a girl on the swing, just push the swing. And they do that. But certain types of people can't be hypnotized because they always want to know what's going on. They're not successful. But if every day they tell you the United States is the greatest country in the world, people sacrifice their lives to give you school, free school and medical care. So you owe that to the past as a form of hypnosis, suggesting over and over again, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States and to the Republic for which it stands. Over and over again, it's like hypnosis. Like you're hypnotized to do something. When the country says, we're at war, we need everybody's allegiance. He's ready. What do you want from me? I'm ready to do it. That's hypnosis. Same thing. Do you understand how hypnosis works? But you have to be subject to that. Obviously it must be that. Proof, Japan, they fought us. The Germans fought us. It must be some suggestions that they make over and over again. This is the Vaterland. Without the Vaterland we are nothing. So Germany needs you and you to help preserve the Vaterland. So, that, in that way, that suggestive system works. And nobody says the Fatherland is going to donate all the war equipment so no one makes profit. That would help better. But the public doesn't know what's missing. So they're suggestive because you're not suggestive to going to a metaphysical church now. You're not suggestive to it. But there are a lot of people that are because they say, there's more to life than what you can see. All that makes sense, but it doesn't tell you anything. A, person is, a human being is more than what you see. I don't doubt that. But what more? And do they have any free will at all? Well, they get married. If they were brought up in an environment where there was no marriage, people lived together. When they related, there'd be no marriage. But if the institutions, everybody comes, and sees you get married, and you wear a certain dress and outfit, all that becomes part of the rep repetitive system, like hypnosis. 
you cannot be hypnotized if a person says, you go back to the Catholic Church now and you worship Jesus Christ. Not anymore, because there's too many things that are elicited that will stop you from being shoved in the given direction. Do you understand that? So the proper study of mankind is the environment they come from. And the behavioral sciences of the future will do a, a, an exceptional job on all aspects of the environment, from nurturing the child, breastfeeding the child, the first moves that a child makes, how it crawls, and when it falls off something, it doesn't go near the edge anymore, but it falls off first before it doesn't go near the edge. It doesn't even know what the edge is, and it falls. So, again, in the study of the production of automobiles, you have to study the shape you want and the machines that make that shape. So the automobile company's main concern is the shaping of all the parts of the car and the heat treating to make different materials stronger. Molybdenum steel is very strong. Chromolyte steel is very strong, but that's done by a guy called a metallurgist. How does he get to be a metallurgist? That's a form of behavior from a metallurgical environment. He studies metals and their strength. He's put in a metallurgy environment. He also study alloys, different mixtures of metals that make strength. And there's a metal called cobalt, which is very tough. And uh, cobalt, mixed with other metals, makes it stronger and also very heat-resisting. So the nose cone of a rocket that enters the atmosphere is made of heat-resisting metal. The way they got it is they mix different metals here. Nobody, if they know that cobalt is heat-resisting, they mix it with other metals they know that are heat-resisting. But if they're not shapeable, they get a shapeable metal and mix it with heat-resisting metal. You understand? A pliable metal. Because if you mix all the heat-resisting metals together, you may not have the strength you need. Sure, it's resistant to heat, but it doesn't have the strength to support the nose cone. So that's how research workers think. That's where they get their ideas from. They're not born, say, well, the best way to solve that problem. They can't do that. They have to know metals and the behavior metals. So they invented different words. One is called ductile that the metal can be shaped and formed. But sometimes they'd shape metal and it'd be too thin in certain areas and thick in other areas. If you take a sheet of metal, any kind of metal, this is a sheet of metal, and you draw squares on it like this, and then you shape it into a compound curve, all the size of the squares change. You know, some a wider part, that means it's going to be thinner than this. So they put the squares on first and then shape it. And the size of the squares tell you how thick it's going to be. If the square is all two inches and it's now three and a half inches and the other squares are smaller, they're too thick, this is too thin. So that tells them how ductile, how shapeable the metal is. Nobody is born an engineer and, and determines how thick metal ought to be. Where do they get that? Only by studying metal in different environments. The military and the Navy takes different metals and puts them in salt water in the lab and come back three years later and look at it and see what effect salt water has on metal. The metal most resistant to salt water attack is titanium. That's what they found out. They put all kinds of metals together. And they found out that uh, if you took a plate in a, in a restaurant, the handling of all those plates make noise. So they found out that if you laminate, there's a cutaway view of a soup dish. If you put a sheet of lead very thin in the ceramic, and then another sheet of ceramic, sort of a sandwich, it makes no noise. Of course, lead does not conduct sound. So you can make pots and pans that make no noise. They're expensive, because, and they don't make them because most people won't buy them. They have to be educated. Educated means 
When you invent a radio, a person has to know what it is. Then when you turn it on, he can hear the president talk. So it's where do you buy them? First, he must be told what it is. When Edison made the electric light, the gas company didn't say, well, what is it? How does it work? They said, if it blows out, it gives up 10 times the amount of light. It might be very poisonous to the eyes. They say whatever they have to say to keep people from buying electric lights. But they made chemical gas lamps that glow very bright, but it used more energy. And there was a guy called a lamp lighter. He used to go down the street at night and light all these lamps. These lamps in the street, they were bright. But he had a long pole with an ignition system that lighted the gas. He was called a lamp lighter. The profession is gone. The electric company pulls a switch and all the lights go on. Now, can that be applied everywhere? I don't see why not. I don't see why a man has to take a car apart and do the same thing, change the valves. If they're in a fixed place and the engine is in a fixed place and they've made a new type faster valve that can be put in faster, all you do is drive your car in and it has an electrical plug system sticking out of your car. When you drive in the station, it goes in and it checks everything on the car and alters it so it works best. That I see the mechanic doing this you know, and checking out this and checking out that. Today, some automobile mechanics do have a plug-in analyzer. When you drive your car in, they plug it in, they look at a chart and it tells the mechanic what he should do. The mechanic thinks he will always repair cars. He's taught not to think outside of that system. The inventor is taught to think outside of the system. He gets paid for that. And so the more studies you do on how much work a person can put out and people that like to talk long on the phone, you monitor their phone conversations. And the more you know about, like I was telling Joel, cashiers in a supermarket, sometimes a phone rings and a person says, are you running a special on beans? Are you running a special on soap? The longer you're on the phone, it monitors. If you're on longer than a minute and a half, you can't tend to customers. So you say you'll have to call back later, or, well, thank you, but here's where you can get all the information you hang up. If you have automatic voice information, which is much better, are you running a special on beans? Yes, we are. When are you running? Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. All automated voice. The cashier can do cashiering work. The shelf stacker can shelf stack. So the Japanese said they learned a great deal from America by going through the supermarkets. And the supermarkets, there are people in the supermarkets that have a special job. And that's to see how fast the soap shelf is emptied. They keep a record of how many bars of soap were there per hour at 12 o'clock, at 2 o'clock, at 3 o'clock. So they learn how to stack the shelves with probable materials that sell. Do you understand that? The supermarkets that did that are in business today. Those that did not do that have been surpassed. It has nothing to do with good nature, be kind to people, it's a process. If the process level promotes the survival of that company, it's used. They don't poison people because it's illegal and easy to detect. But I can assure you, if there was profit in the amount of people that died, a funeral home does make money. And some funeral homes just had a bunch of ashes which they sold to people that were not the ashes of the husband or the wife. Are you familiar with that? And some graveyards dig up the bodies and sell the grave three or four times. Then after three or four years, they dig out the bodies and say, we have an extra grave space. So the, the monetary system tends to not make everybody corrupt, but enough people corrupt to make the system very burdensome. Okay, so when you go to church, it tells you to be good, but it doesn't tell you how good to be. So you say, well, look, I'm just a human being. I was tempted not to pay my taxes, or I overlooked that. Now, if a senator says, 
I overlook it, a little more leniency is given. If the average guy says, I overlook it, he says, no, you're a cheat. You're cheating the government. It's like stealing from the government. You understand? If you steal a flashlight from the company that makes flashlights, you're a thief. But the companies, big corporations, if they had metal detectors outside when you leave the plant to know whether you're walking out with any flashlights, the profits will be higher. But they'll say, how much is the insulation? If it's $10,000, well, you have to let it go. Or you have a minister come in and lecture on the merits of honest. <laughs> so the more honest you can make the poor, the less surveillance you have to have. If you can condition Arabs not to bomb or kill Catholics, that would be a new program. And the Catholics ought to pay for that, because they pay for it anyway. So I'm telling you about ethics. If ethics does not suit the survival of an animal or a person or a corporation, they usually do not have too ethical a system. Now some companies may be more ethical than others if it doesn't affect their profits too much. Again, psychiatry in the future will be great students of all the prime effectors, including diet, early childhood, how the parents behaved in relation to the child. The child is the end product and should not be studied. Do you understand that? That's all I want to say about psychology. It'll be the study of human behavior and the origins of it. What originates human behavior? Okay, thanks for coming everyone. We can take some questions. Sorry, just quickly cut in here while I've got the chance. I just want to say to everyone that we're still looking for people to contribute and collaborate on many of the projects on the TVP website on the Get Involved. If you're interested in getting involved in any of the projects that are listed up there, examples would be things like submissions for TVP magazine, joining any of the support teams, design teams, for example, if you do 3D or anything like this. Please check out the website under Get Involved and the various teams, TVP Core, TVP Design and TVP Support. And there's instructions there on how to get involved in those projects. We do need people as, as much as possible, so it'd be great if people could start getting involved in some of those. Thanks, Andrew. Have you got any announcements, Roxanne, or anything that you'd like to say to the TV characters? We can announce that we are going to Russia, giving a lecture on September 8th. And Andrew's going to join us there with Yulita. And also on the 2nd of September, we'll be doing a lecture in Bosnia. So you can check that on our homepage. We have that up on the events, what's new and the events. Is that up now, Andrew? Yes, that is, yeah. Great, thanks. So we can take some questions if you'd like. What does TVP think is the most important for the Venus Project's success? That more people understand what it's about. Yes, and then work toward it. Learn about it and talk to others. Jacques, I have a question here from Facebook. How would the Venus Project accommodate people with handicapped conditions? It will provide the best equipment we're able to design and make it available free of charge to anyone needing that equipment. Yes, because we understand that anybody could become handicapped at any time. So it's very important. I was wondering if structures would be handicapped accessible. I understand that people would be given what they needed, like wheelchairs or whatever high-tech devices needed. But what about things like stairs? Yeah, so whatever is needed. Any kind of conveyor that will move the handicapped people vertically, horizontally, or any other direction. And the equipment will be designed to meet the particular kind of handicap that a person has. My presentation actually for the Russia event in September, 
is actually on functional design, where I go into quite a lot of detail about how the design principles will be very different in a resource-based economy, designing for function rather than aesthetics, which is the current methodology used in design globally. So yes, things like disabled access and stuff would be fundamental to the designs of the buildings to make sure they're accessible to everybody. Today is, is already exists uh, lots of technologies will have, which can help handicapped people, as you know, is moving assistant exoskeletons. So the structures probably shouldn't be specifically made for each kind of handicap. It is easier to make the devices to make them move naturally. I agree with you. Yeah, we agree. Question. When will the recently collected lectures from the 1970s be available on the Venus Project Shop's website? I really couldn't tell you at this point. We're editing them, we're bringing them in, we're archiving them right now. We've just had somebody here who was archiving a lot of things for us and we have over 500 hours of the old 70s lectures. So it's really laborious going through and editing them all and trying to clean up the sound. We really don't have a date when more will be up, but we have three finished and we're trying to finish one more to make a new set and we'll probably put pieces of those up within the next two weeks, you think, Joe? Yeah, okay. yeah, hopefully within the next two weeks. In the midst of making a major motion picture yourself, what advice can you give to aspiring filmmakers who want to implement RBE related material into their stories? What should they focus on? And are there any plans on making a video about this topic? Well, they have to study a resource-based economy. That would be required, otherwise they couldn't possibly do it, unless they inquire into how various aspects of the new system works. Yeah, I mean, I think a well-rounded understanding of the socio-economic system that is a resource-based economy would be really needed. They'd need to understand the interactive relationships between technology, science, and an understanding of how social and economic system works would be the main focus and how values are shaped and behavior. This is for Jacques. You have a picture of a Star Trek Enterprise in your house. Did you work on any designs for Star Trek or maybe special effects? No, Jacques didn't work with Star Trek. He lectured in California many, many years ago before Star Trek to many science fiction writers. So some of those things might have come in from his lectures. But aside from that, that picture that we have is of Doug Drexler holding some of the models that were done for Star Trek. Doug Drexler did many of the 3D animations for Star Trek and Star Trek the movies. And he saw Jacques on Engineering the Impossible, a TV show that was put on public broadcasting television. And he flew out here, he ordered all the books, then flew out here, and he left and continued communication with us, and he took many of Jacques' sketches and made them into animations. And people are well acquainted with a lot of those animations, I'm sure. He's gone on to do the special effects for Battleship Galacta, and I believe he has used some of those animations that he did within that series. So some people might have recognized some of the architecture of Jacques, and that's how it came about. He is also doing his own film right now, and he just asked if he could use some of Jacques' designs, and we approved of that. What do you think about the use of transgenic food? I'm not familiar with it. Can you describe that? You probably meant transgenetic, which involves yeah. genetic modification, right? Yeah, I wasn't familiar with the term transgenetic. Yeah, they're talking about genetically modified foods. I approve of it if it's been tested over a long period of time. I'm against modifying food without very careful tests. And today in the monetary system, they... I'm against it today. Yes. They do not do the testing they need to, or if it comes out with a negative response, they still put it on the market 
if it helps them financially. There are no real tests for that. Would handicapped people be just accommodated or would the aim be to give them an able body? If I can quickly jump on this one first and then I'll pass it over to Jack. The whole basis of the Venus Project is to improve people's lives. Regardless of your social customs, your religions, your abilities or disabilities, uh, it's to improve the lives of all people and to benefit people in any way possible. Um, so if science and technology and biomedicine, etc., we, we were able to fix people that, had, that were quadriplegics or fix people that were paralyzed from the next down, things like this, or we could give them extensional systems, things like bodies, smart suits, etc., to help them, then obviously that's the kind of things that, that scientists and engineers would be focusing on is to improve the lives of all people in any area possible. Yes, that's true, Andrew. I can't add very much to that, except we will fulfill every need we're capable of fulfilling at the time. And if we're not capable, we'll do further studies on it to gather more information. But we'll provide the best that we have at the time. In a resource-based economy, can we have our own radio or TV show? If so, how do we go about scheduling the time for the show and how is the decision made on who gets to broadcast their show? Every program that people come up with, if it's an education or improvement of technology, would go to the appropriate department and be released on the information channels. Would you say that it would also be somewhat of a high-tech vaudeville? Vaudeville was a very popular variety show back in your youth. People would get up on stage and perform various acts. Does that sound familiar? Yes, it does now. Vaudeville, I don't think we it? would use much vaudeville. I think most entertainment in the future will be in information that people can use and apply immediately. Andrew, could you tell everybody a little bit about what you said in regards to chips? This was in reference to the question about will people be submitted to RFID chips in the Venus Project, is that right? That's correct. Yeah, basically Joe pulled a question from Facebook about someone's concerns about RFID chipping and monitoring of people within the Venus Project. First of all, there would be no need for embedded microchips in people, unless they specifically wanted them. There's many ways that you could have an RFID chip if you wanted one. You could have them in your mobile device, in your wristband, you could have it in a ring, you could have it in hair extensions, or you know, however you, you any, any jewellery or anything like this, you could have an RFID chip in. If you was happy to have your, for example, medical vital signs monitored by the health centre in your city, for example, Lots of people die of asphyxia, which is where they stop breathing in their sleep. If you had some sort of health monitor on you at all times that was connected to RFID and was sending signals back to the local health clinic in your city, if you had that condition, you'd get medical help before you die, probably. If you didn't have it, then you most certainly wouldn't and you'd die of that medical condition. Recently, I read a news article about a guy that was found recently on a mountain after an avalanche. Rescue crews were able to locate him because he had purchased and registered with the local authorities a GPS locator that ultimately saved his life. I think if he had asked him in the helicopter or even in the hospital afterwards if he felt restricted or enslaved by the device that ultimately saved his life, the answer would have been no. People tend to be scared of technology because of our social system. They're just not aware of that. Parents monitor their child's health, for example. Is that detrimental to the child? I've never seen a parent stop monitoring their child's health or stop being concerned about their child's health when they cough or when they're not breathing in their sleep and things like this because they're worried about whether they're being monitoring their child too much. Uh, it's not something that's considered. The problem is in our social system that we have people monitoring us for the wrong reasons. It's only in systems where there's competition that you see negative effects of monitoring. So for example, they'll be used to gain the competitive edge in whatever social, economic or political area it is that you're dealing with.
airplane pilots monitor the amount of fuel and the fuel consumption of a passenger airline while you're on it. Would you prefer that they didn't do that? People complain about monitoring, but they don't really understand what that means. To monitor the safety of an aircraft while you're on it, I think is a good reason for monitoring. And I don't think anyone would argue with that when they're sitting on a plane. So it really comes down to the social system that the monitoring is done within as to whether or not it's detrimental to you. Okay, there was a question someone asked me, are the Venus Project's ideals and proposals of the Venus Project subject to interpretation? And if so, how can they subjectively be limited when discussing the Venus Project? By using diagrams with the lectures so that every presentation of any idea is always done with pictures and illustrations so people draw the same conclusion, not subject to interpretation. Yeah, something you'll notice Jack does in all of his presentations, um, and you'll see I just did in, in that one, the more real-world examples you can give of the things that you're talking about, people find that it's much harder for people to misinterpret an actual event that's happened and, or, or something that they could reproduce themselves. So by giving examples of things, you're solidifying the definition of what it is that you're trying to define or talk about. Jacques, how would you define propaganda? Propaganda is using devices to affect human behavior that you understand people have been conditioned to accept the word of particular kinds of authorities. And if they accept the word of the king or the priest, if the priest makes a certain statement, propaganda is using the techniques that you've already established and putting them to practice. But it has nothing to do with the real world. Were emotions necessary to human evolution and survival over the millennia? If so, how will these emotions that have been crafted over the years change in the future? And will they play any role in our survival? Useful emotions like moving away from pain would be normal to the future. And emotions about feeling good about what you're doing, the work you'll be doing in the future will alleviate pain in people, provide for their needs, do away with depression and long-term standing feelings of inadequacy. So I would say that the fact that people are doing that would make us feel good. And feeling good about reality is much better than feeling good about artificiality. Do you think emotions served in the past in history? I can't deal with that. Also, when you convert your emotions into an action pattern that's useful, a lot of people emote a lot of times. And even in some of the Egyptian countries or Arab countries, they pay people to cry out in pain and sorrow at funerals. But if emotions are transferred into an action pattern to help in society, then it becomes useful. That's the effect we would want people to have. That's the behavior we would want people to have in the future. For example, if a car runs off a cliff, sometimes somebody would go down and assist the people, and they'd say they're there and hold their hands and wait them until the doctor comes, and then the doctor would patch them up. But the engineer would come along and try and figure out why the car went over the side of the hill and make a barrier so the car can no longer go over the side of the hill. Today, people really recognize people that come along and say they are there or the doctor is thanked and appreciated. But a lot of times the engineer behind the scenes, they don't understand the role that they play, but that's a huge role to stop that from happening in the first place. And I think in the Jacques and Roxanne seem to have been booted. I'm sure they'll be right back. Yeah, we got a huge storm front coming through, so probably it got the uh, power surge or something. I would like to uh, add for 
for this emotion question, if I can. So basically, emotions they govern by feeling of their right or wrong, which is basically depends on the moral. And we have morality that it also depends on how we react in our environment. So, for example, if you drive in a car on a slippery road and you have in front of you a little girl and an old lady and the tree on the side, you have to make a decision who you're going to hit. And this is the moral choice of yours. But in the society we're talking about, we're going to design the road and the car so they're not going to injure anybody or yourself. So that way, morality became obsolete. Hey, Andrew, I got a question for you. I was wondering, when critics of TVP mention freedom, they're afraid that somebody else will be in control of their lives. How would you respond to that? Freedom is subjective. It's open to misinterpretation. It's, I would consider it a dangerous word. Do people really want freedom? What kind of freedoms do they want? Could I have the freedom to kill you if I don't like you? Could I have the freedom to rape Vixie if I felt like it? How about the freedom to abuse people or the freedom to speak hate speech in front of everyone? How about the freedom to hold all of your resources and stop you having access to them? That's my freedom and you stopping me from doing that would be encroaching upon my freedom. So how much freedom do you want to give people? Do you want everybody to be completely free? I think the question is wrong. I think that's the real problem of it. Do you want freedom of biases such as sexism or ageism or elitism? How about the freedom to teach people nonsense? All of these things are very damaging to our social system. So it really comes down to the question. I think the question is inherently wrong. People don't understand. It's not actually freedom that they want. What they really want is for their whole global culture to share the same values as them that are beneficial to both the individual and the species as a whole. And that really is what people need. That's, that's, what, that's what people really want over freedom. When people share the same values of you, for example, if we all share the same values of rape, murder, abuse, hatred, corruption, and all other areas of social harm are unacceptable, then and that limiting people's access to education or resources is unacceptable. You don't need to define those things anymore. You don't need laws for them. You don't need to define them as being free. They're a standard, they're the set value set that, people's, that people follow. So there would be no point in defining a freedom within that system. So people must understand in the Venus Project, there's no ruling elite and no one's in charge. People would work on problems that our global society have, have, you know, have got that we need to collaborate with others based on shared values, not on laws. To me, freedom sounds a bit like this. <laughs> and pretty much has exactly the same meaning to me. I think we only give so much importance to the word freedom now because we don't really have it. We aren't free, are we? Well, the word well, the freedom, freedom would be dispensed with in the future. It doesn't make sense. It cannot be defined. Therefore, it's just an invention that doesn't work. There'll be new words replacing the word freedom, meaning people will be able to invent and work on anything they want to work on, except that which harms society. There'd be weapons of no kind, except there'd be no painful weapons or bombers or guns or anything like that developed in the future. It's not a question of debating a subject. It's a question of surpassing the need for such words, such as freedom. It's a ridiculous concept. Yet they use those words, I'm talking about propaganda, they use those words like freedom, democracy, honor, to get people to go and die for corporations in other lands so they have free access, you can use the word there, free access to resources for these corporations. So it's a terrible word how it's used today. Sorry, we got knocked off with a lightning storm here. I have a question here from the audience. People say that Skinner's study was faulty because he studied mice and pigeons and yet he projected the results on human beings. How would Jacques respond to that claim? I'm not sure of that. In regards to Skinner, you're not sure yes. of that? Skinner also did a lot of experimentation with 
human beings and were able to predict human behavior and really predict what people would do because of his studies and his principles. A good book to read on Skinner actually was Out Behaviorism. Um, yeah, it covers a lot of his sort of human side of his experiments and stuff. So I guess we'll wrap it up for today. Yes, thank you again. Thanks all. I'm going to shoot off now. Quick reminder, if anyone's interested in joining any of the teams or starting to collaborate on any of the projects, please check out the website under Get Involved, TVP Core, TVP Design and TVP Support. There's loads of stuff people can do from submitting articles for TVP Magazine or for the Venus Projects website. Tons, tons and tons of projects up there, uh, 3D stuff and all sorts. So, um, get involved. Thanks, everyone.